establish our connection there with uh, Dr. Martin Koyabe from the UK. Uh, Dr. Martin, carry on. Uh, I think we had some technical uh, challenges there with the audio, but uh, we've sorted it out right now. Carry on with the conversation. And I was just uh, asking, I don't know, I didn't get to hear what you what was your introductory uh, statement so far but the issue of venezuelans i know you've been following so far uh since uh, we had that particular report as well from uh, the dci what are you learning yeah i think the issue of the venezuelan just to start with that point it's very unfortunate that on one hand you had this meeting that uh, the ig and of course kinoti had with chebukati and they came out of this meeting saying that they didn't have any issue whatsoever uh, that uh, that they've resolved the issue of those particular venezuelans let's assume that there was a smoking gun as alleged by the dci what that means then is that the dci needs to come up with what is it that is this particular smoking gun what was it that was resolved earlier because he came out and released a statement to kenyans saying that this issue has been resolved and also we need to go back a little bit and understand what were the contractual agreements between the IEBC and the Venezuelans were these persons or people working as third party agents for the Venezuelans who are not necessarily uh in the IEBC radar or or, or, or you know or something like that uh, they, they, there are also very many questions within that so that's why this issue seems a little bit fishy because at that particular point when they had resolved everything they didn't even disclose to the public what were the issues that were resolved. And to later on come and say, we believe that this data that they have has issues to do with uh, compromising what the, you know, the elections that we've had without any tangible evidence to link the two is what really uh, baffles me on one hand. But I uh, just allow me to go back to that question that you had asked me earlier on the issues around the assessment of the evidence that we've seen or the affidavits that have been submitted both by the uh, i think as mio and, and and this is of course uh, it's the affidavit that was submitted by george njoroge i believe and also the affidavit that was submitted by the iebc when you look at these two affidavits it really gives you a sense of where each person is trying to claim or counterclaim what we are now seeing playing out in the courts or we'll see very soon when you consider the leaps and bounds that have been covered by especially the iebc in terms of the resilience of the server that means they attained according to what they've given out roughly about 99.94 percent of all the kims kits transmitted uh, the form 34 a's except for the 28 constituencies which i think we now know exactly what happened uh, that's something which is very commendable. There is also the issue around three, more than 300 million uh, people really uh, hit the, you know, the website in terms of uh, hits of visits. And that also gave you a sense of how resilient and the redundancy that was put in place. But let's come down to the, where the really, the, the, the tarmac or rather the tire meets the tarmac. And this is when you look at the evidence that was given by both parties. So let me start with, first of all, the one by George Roger. Uh, to me, my assessment, and I'm very honest on my assessment, and I want to be very, very candid on this, is that you have an affidavit that is seeking for a smoking gun. You have an affidavit that really does not go through the principles of forensics the way we know it. And I'll give you an example. One of the issues that this affidavit claims, and I think it is claimed in page 14, page 15, page 17, are very serious claims. Because they are claiming that, for example, that there was this particular server, for example, in page 17, or 14, rather, there's this server with an IP address, I think it was 172.21.5.4, uh, which was being used to access a specific, uh, uh, you know, machines, and therefore, there is suspicion that it might have been used to do the intercepting or, and maybe sending information. So you find that there is a lot of not confirmed details, but assertions. And then when you look again in terms of what they are claiming in page 15, that the downloading and the conversion of the system and the upload of information uh, within the server using a specific format might have resulted in those particular CVS files or the CSV files that they've actually uh, highlighted to change the results of these particular forms. And then lastly, 
there is also this very, very uh, serious claim that they have, which actually talks about what they claim to be the, the, the reverse. Instead of doing the forward turning, they are claiming that there were some errors at Form 34 and uh, 34Bs and 35 and, and, and 34C, which were created that could have now compromised the total tallying of the whole process. And when I looked at the information to see exactly how do you get to the bottom of this, there were specific discrepancies, especially when you look at how the Azmio affidavit specifies, especially the RTS, how does a PO, that is a presiding officer, summarize the information of Form 34A and transmit those results into uh, at least uh, to, the, to, 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 the, to the RO, that means the returning officer at the tallying center. So if you look at the process of what has been described there, differs from what has been described with the IEBC as stipulated by the constitution according to IEBC. So you see there's a difference there in terms of how those steps are taken. Then when you come to the issues of just how this particular evidence has been conducted, it is not very clear when you come to the outcome. So for example, if you tell me someone logged into the system and changed specific data in order to reflect a specific result, then it's only fair that you also give us that result so that we can see it in picture form, so that we can be able to associate the crime that was committed under the bonnet with what the outcomes looks like. Now, it is the outcome that is not there but there's a lot of assertion that this could have led to the other. The other issue also is that if you look at in general, there is a claim, of course, by Gidongo that there was this amount of uh, people who had been compromised, they were trying to hack into the system and so forth. Those particular logs of hacking should have been at least evident to the person who actually wrote the affidavit to George, for example. So he would have seen those particular logs at least to make sure that we could see those. And the IP addresses should have been external because the IP address that they keep referring to, which is the 172.0.xxx, those IP addresses are normally given for networks within a specific controlled environment that you can use. They are not necessarily external IP addresses that you can have so that we could have seen what those cases were. And of course, the IEBC has data that they can actually show of what the infringement was or maybe the firewalls, which type of IP addresses were trying to hack into the system. I'm sure that will be put in front of the court and that will show probably what, how robust the system was. And uh, finally, the other issue is also the principle of how these affidavits are presented. Uh, now, the principle might be different in terms of the steps that one takes in presenting an affidavit. But let's be honest, the affidavit that have been presented by George is really wanting, especially when you look at the data that is missing. And I was very keen here, and just in case for reference purposes, there are specific pages that are lacking specific information which should have been there, I believe. So for example, if you look at page eight, section two and four, page 50, section eight and 10, page 51, section two, page 53, section 15, and page 57, section two, and page 62, section five, they are, they are missing data. So really, when it comes to the totality of what the, this affidavit really shows, to me, it seems to me you had two people in a room. Maybe one person was a lawyer, the other person was, understands technology. So you are trying to fit what evidence you can gather in order to support a specific legal position. And lastly, they've also claimed that there was this particular IBC person who might have logged into one system or the other. Yes, that might have been the case. But how are we sure that the logs that you're taking have not been doctored to reflect that? And let's even give them the benefit of the doubt that those logs are not doctored. What was the effect of those logging in? Has it compromised the system to the level that we are now trying to anticipate? And has it brought everything to the level that we can say it was not just unfair to the people who voted? Those are the issues that we need to take into consideration. And lastly, it's the issue around what I would say, if they were really logical in trying to ascertain 
what the forensics should look like, one would have gotten a calculator, calculate all the statistics that were given in Form 34As, come out with a figure, and then work out if that figure is the same as what Chebukati produced. That's what they're not doing. Right, thank and you. That's exactly my, my contribution there. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And, and of course, you orient my thoughts to uh, those issues uh, that uh, I wanted to ask you regarding how then did we, could we authenticate that, uh, you know, this was a log information from the IBC servers. And you've mentioned that because we cannot try to authenticate if they were actually from the IBC servers. And where did he get the list of the persons uh, authorized to access the servers to be able to deduce that uh, uh, they there was an authorized login. I think those are questions that uh, when we circle back with you and of course uh, Justice Nyamwea and Dan Mazo here will be able to uh, try and broach these issues so far. But uh, thank you Dr. Martin. Do hang on. We continue with, uh, with the show. But